What's going on, fellas? This video is about precious metal recovery, and we are using electrolysis to generate this anode sludge that I have sitting in this small crucible. And I'm just attempting to do a small fire assay using a 10,000 watt oxyhydrogen torch that I have infused with some propane gas to provide a reducing flame. I just wanted to see how hard it is to melt this stuff and come to find out it's very stubborn and once it gets glowing white hot, it puts off a lot of gases. All right, fellas, so you guys are gonna kill me, man. Um, I run out of propane. Um, so I didn't want to just sit there with the oxyhydrogen flame and just roast this thing to death. Even though that is a good experiment, which should be done, I feel it would maybe even vaporize some of the stuff that gets so hot. So I'm stopping the test, but the least I could do is show you what I wasted all, all the propane on before I started this test. I was doing a video for some people who were asking to see the performance of oxyhydrogen propane brazing. Basically what we have is a 10,000 watt electrolyzer and a small tank of propane that will be infused with the oxyhydrogen coming off of this machine that we will use to make our reducing flame. Okay, so people are asking me all the time about the performance of my oxyhydrogen torch and they want to know if it's worth it versus just buying an oxygen bottle. And I can tell you now I've done both and I would never just go with an oxygen bottle. The power of this torch is just phenomenal. Um, I'm not using a little torch anymore. I'm using the torch that Muhammad gave me, the big $5,000 Mucho Mondo. And this thing is incredible. There's so much you can do with oxyhydrogen that you can't do with just oxygen also. I don't always infuse the gas with propane. I sometimes use acetone, but I've been doing the propane thing lately because I like the control that you get with the flame. Acetone is just kind of a, you get what you got, a reducing flame. Whereas this here, I can really crank the heat up for some quick soldering. And anyone who's ever brazed before, you can you know how hard and tricky it can be to pull this off. So this torch allows me to get in and get out real quick before I fry the part and mess up my work. So I'm definitely pleased with the performance of this thing. When I got time, I'll, I'll show you guys a little bit more about it. Okay, fellas, I got this thing put back together. We are now running the graphite anode and we are continuing on with the uh, electro winding of this spent e-waste solution that was used to plate copper using e-waste anodes. Okay, we're gonna call that close enough. We're at 30 amps approximately and 4.3 volts. This test pretty much corroborates the notion that a simple graphite anode is not suitable for this process. A special resin doped or vitrified carbon anode would be needed for this process. I want to show you guys something cool about these cyclones, these uh, hydrocyclones. If you give the bottom just a little bit of flow, their performance is increased exponentially. So if you were to vent this hose off to a small sedimentation tank, it would greatly enhance the performance of the hydrocyclone. I am pulling literally all of that carbon or graphite particle out of there at a much faster rate as you can see. Either that or you need a large sedimentation tank just below the hydrocyclone itself. But this definitely works very well. So we would want to do that and have these bled off to a sedimentation tank. You can see the difference with it shut off, it really slows down. If the velocity is too high on the hydrocyclone, some of this material can become entrained back in that center cyclone that's taking place. I've actually sat there and watched the particles do that. But as you can see, we are losing graphite anode at an exponential rate. This is just not gonna work, guys. I'm gonna go ahead and let it run for a little while longer and then shut it down. Okay, fellas, so we are going to reinsert the lead anode the graphite was a bad deal. I went ahead and hooked up a filter and I'm gonna run this solution in a filter loop for a couple of hours before we resume the test. Hopefully that doesn't botch the test. I'm just gonna run it till the fluid clears back up to where we was. Um, there's so much contamination in there from the anode ablation. That uh, 
I just feel like it could um, mess up my samples. So I am able to isolate this gray material. We have two different gray materials now. We have a dark gray and a light gray. And the way I've isolated this it's kind of like a sedimentation mass chromatography. I shake the beaker up real fast and this heavy stuff settles right away, but a suspension of the other liquid remains and I simply immediately decant that into a smaller graduated cylinder and um, have been very successful at getting nothing but this material out of this beaker simply by doing this right here. And then I hurry up and dump that top solution out. Okay guys, just to be sure all of the copper has been removed from the solution, I went ahead and fired the cell back up with the lead anode in place this time and ran it for an additional 44 hours, giving us a total of about a hundred and some hours to electrowind that solution. However, after 60 some hours, all of the copper had been removed and we began the gray powder production, which I'm thinking is either tin sulfate or lead sulfate. 38 hours, the only thing we were producing in the cell was this powder. Basil, you mentioned you think that it's lead sulfate. Um, the chemicals I'm seeing that match this color are on, in the line with tin sulfate. I'm not saying this isn't lead sulfate. I have no idea what it is. I really would like to find out. We're gonna put some in uh, some different acids like you suggested to see the color it makes. My nitric acid should be here today. We could also do a flame test, but that's neither here nor there. So a quick recap. We start off with some clean copper. Towards the middle, we get a strata of dirtier stuff. The top strata was the gray, white, mysterious powder. We're actually getting a dark gray powder too, which I do in fact believe is the lead sulfate but the white stuff I'm not so sure. And there is 18% tin content in that anode. So this is what we got. We have successfully removed all of the copper out of the spent electrolyte solution, thereby confirming the plausibility of this process. Okay, here's the electrolyte from the electro winding process that we performed with the insoluble lead anode. We sucked all the copper out of this electrolyte. It now just contains whatever can be dissolved in the sulfuric acid, mainly nickel. So this is what it looks like before we boil it. Just wanted to get a shot. I'm just gonna keep filling this beaker up and filling it up until I start to get crystals to precipitate out. Not sure how well you can see this. This is the material we ended up with after boiling. There are two different powders present. There is a green powder, which I believe is the nickel sulfate, and then there's a white substance, which I believe is possibly the tin sulfate because there was 18% tin content. This is the uh, rest of it here. And you can see we have a, a sedimentation that forms almost instantly. If we shake this up, um, you'll have a milky top strata and this bottom layer. And I think if we decant it instantly after shaking the material, you could possibly get that white stuff to go away. Let me shake this up a little bit and show you what I'm talking about. This is highly acidic, so I should probably set the camera down. You kind of see the different colors of solution. But um, essentially, after shaking it up, if you instantly dump this top layer off, it does make a different substance. When I first put this uh, substance in this graduated cylinder, it all looked like this, and it has slowly just sank down. You really need a filter press for stuff like this. So that pretty much um, is where we are now in this phase of that electro winding process. So what we're gonna do is separate the white stuff from the green stuff. And we're also gonna keep this green liquid and we're going to attempt to electro wind the nickel 
out of that material by using a small beaker bath with nickel electrodes. I'm also going to try it with a carbon. Um, if you have pure nickel solution, a carbon electrode is sufficient. You can use a lead electrode if you add 50 parts per million of cobalt to stop the lead anode from going into solution. Okay, here is the uh, electro winding unit. And we have got something. Something is there. What do you think that is? Well, the first time I opened it, it was a little shinier than this. So this could be a mixture of nickel, tin, and other materials. That is kind of cool looking. Check that out. It looks like uh, nickel to me, boys. Wow. I'm gonna have to put this in the front of the video so you guys don't take off before you see it. That looks like nickel metal to me, guys. Now, if we take a sample of this off and dissolve it in nitric acid, it should turn blue if my memory serves me. So, that's my recollection. Oh, that is so awesome. That is too cool, guys. Wow. And no controls, just flat out blistering power. Um, I'll have to do the calculations to determine the energy density. But I want to say there's 256 square centimeters in there, and we were at about 30 amps. I want to believe that put us at about 101 milliamps per square centimeter, which is just blasting power when it comes to... I mean, you're looking at a normal... A 36 milliamps per square centimeter is considered extremely high, and only the most high-performance equipment can do that effectively. Uh, we were running at 100-something probably there, maybe more. So, wow, that is just amazing. I've got to get these pictures to, uh, to Basel right away.